Welcome to Hope Today on this fabulous Tuesday. We're your host Amanda Brocker and Tom Hollis and today we are definitely going to give you hope so that you can stand firm in your faith in this world that literally is falling <laughs> apart, Tom. Well, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but we're going to talk about it from another angle. You know, life is unpredictable and the world's increasingly unstable. People have never been so confounded and confused. Everything seems like it's spiraling downward. Where, where is God in all of this where there's good news? The Apostle Paul, he also experienced a lot of setbacks, even persecution. He was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. And he wrote a book about it in the book of Philippians. And pastor and Bible teacher Robert Morgan is going to be with us. He's going to help us unpack the book and uh, what it uh, means for us today and how we can rejoice in times. I mean, most of us have not been through that kind of trial. But Paul talks about rejoicing even in that. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to ask some questions. You're going to want to call someone up. Let them know. Cornerstone is having an amazing interview on Hope Today, and he brings a wealth of wisdom to us. Tom, you were just reflecting on this book. I, I mean, it's something that you said could be used in a small group. Yeah, yeah, there's so much in it. Uh, again, the, the book is called Whatever Happens, How to Stand Firm in Your Faith When the World is Falling Apart, and it is just a, a, a great study in Philippians. There's so much to dig into there. It's going to be great. Also, if you, if you need prayer, remember that uh, we always have prayer partners standing by. They're always there, ready to pray. That's right. You know, prayer is an essential part of Cornerstone Television. It's been from the beginning, and we are thankful for that opportunity. It's, it's like coming to the altar. Yeah. So in a church service, well, we're a television station, so people are out there watching us, maybe on their phones or in the hospital bed or at their in their car. I mean, they, they can be anywhere, literally watching us. And just one call, you can literally be like at the altar yeah. and having a prayer person pray for you. I love that. That's right, we do. Well, our next guest is a great friend of ours, as we mentioned here at Cornerstone. Robert J. Morgan is a Bible teacher, an author, and he's written a new book called Whatever Happens, How to Stand Firm in Your Faith When the World is Falling Apart. Robert, it's great to have you back with us on Hope Today. Thank you. I'm always glad to be with you guys. It's a wonderful blessing uh, to be a part of the ministry that God has given to you. Well, it's a wonderful blessing to uh, just talk to you and dive deep into some of the parts of Scripture. And, 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 you know, I love to do that. And you've done that with this book and you've done it in the book of Philippians. So could you tell me just about the significance of that? Why is this an important book for us? Again, Paul was running into some really difficult times when he wrote this book. Could you just unpack that for us? Well, I've been studying the book of Philippians for a half century. I have taught through it and preached through it many, many times. And it's one of the favorite books that people have in the Bible. And I've met a number of people that have memorized it. There's only four chapters there. It's got several great themes, but it comes out of a very interesting background. The Apostle Paul had wanted to go to Spain uh, for his fourth mission trip. Instead, he was arrested in Jerusalem, and then he was nearly beaten, and then he was nearly assassinated, and then he was taken to Caesarea for two years while he was uh, under arrest, and then he was put on a ship that sailed into a hurricane and crashed, wrecked. And then he washed up on the island of Malta and was bitten by a viper. And then finally he made it to Rome and he was under arrest there in his own rented house for two years. And people in Philippi thought, what has this man gone through? We must be, we must help him. And so they sent him a gift and someone to help him. And he wrote back the book of Philippians and he said, you know, whatever happens, stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's full of joy, it's full of uh, fortitude, and it's full of ways to help us in very practical aspects of our lives be joyful and strong, even when everything in the world seems to be falling apart. Well, I mean, that is a wonderful goal. It sounds a little kind of like pie in the sky. How do we do this? How do we really, you know, stand firm when everything, uh, even, even some of our institutions and things we depended on, maybe in our life or someone's going through a marriage breakup or who knows what, there's just something that, is, is, uh, that they thought was dependable, all of a sudden they're on unsteady ground. How does this book help us out? How does Philippians help us in that? Well, I think one of the things we do when we find ourselves in 
a difficult place is to go to the book of Philippians and study it. There are so many verses there that help us. This is the book that says that the things that have happened to us turn out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. This is the book that says, let the mind that is in Christ Jesus be in you. This is the book that says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. This is the book that says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is the book that says God will provide for all of your needs through the resources of his endless wealth. So I've gone through the book of Philippians and pulled out 31 different lessons, one for every day of the month. Mm -hmm. And I think pouring ourselves into a book like Philippians when we're going through a difficult time or the times around us seem unstable is a tremendous way to be grounded and strong and joyful because joy is one of the themes of this little book. Yeah, I love that. I love that joy is in there, even in the most difficult circumstances. So what is a strategy? How do we uh, uh, develop a strategy, a plan for difficult times, maybe beforehand, but even when we're in them, how do we develop a strategy for that joy? Well, that's what the 31 chapters are about. It's a 31 uh, chapter strategic plan for doing it. For example, one of the chapters says develop, uh, one of the chapters in my book says develop a life motto. And that's based on Philippians 127. Paul gave us his life motto for to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now there's something interesting that I discovered as I researched for this book. The word Christ in the Greek is Christos and the word gain and the Greek is kerdos, and Paul wrote this book originally in the Greek. So when the original readers read it, it was very terse and, uh, and alliterative. It said to live Christos, to die kerdos. And what a great slogan that is. If we go on living, then we do it for Christ. And if we end up dying, well, that is tremendous profit. That is gain for us. That is better by far, he says, so having some life slogans and mottos like that, that's one of the 31 strategies that help us in times like these. And to me, it's hard to find a better life slogan than to live as Christ, to die as gain. That pretty well covers everything, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it sure does. I just have to ask you, I hadn't planned on this. Do you have a life motto or do you have a, I mean, obviously that one. Do you have any others that really uh, have a, uh, directed your life? Yes. When I was in college, they wanted us to put our life Bible verse or our life motto uh, under our picture of the yearbook. Mm -hmm. And so my life motto that I chose for that picture was the will of God, nothing more, nothing less. And so I've kept that, uh, but I've sort of uh, also adopted uh, Philippians 127, uh, you know, in the Greek, to live Christos, to die Kyrdos. Uh, I haven't quite had, had the time to make that made into a plaque, but I think for us to have a guiding verse or motto in our lives, to have it maybe uh, put in calligraphy or, or engraved on a plaque and to keep it over our desk or in our bedroom or something, it's very helpful because it summarizes for us in a very easy to remember statement uh, what we need to do, the truth that we need to do to make every day an overcoming and a victorious day. Amen. That is powerful information you're giving us. I encourage all of us, including myself, to sit down and write out our life motto so that way we know why we believe what we we believe it. it. It makes it easier to share it as well. Well, Robert, I was just thinking about you spoke of in your book, creating a mental hymn book. And so I'm really interested to find out, you know, in your mental hymn book, you know, are there new or old hymns? We, we want to know what this is like. <laughs> I can't tell you how important this is. You know, I wrote a series of three books called Then Sings My Soul a number of years ago that are still on the best selling list on, uh, then Sings My Soul is a series of books about the great hymns of the faith. So I love the new music and I love the old hymns. The reason that I put this in the book, it's in one of the early chapters because in the background of the book of Philippians, we have Paul and Silas 
and Timothy going to the city of Philippi to start a church. Paul and Silas are arrested and stripped and whipped, and they are chained in the middle of the dungeon where there are no lights, and they are hurting and bleeding and no doubt traumatized. But at midnight, they are singing songs. And these songs were hymns of praise to God. I went through the book of Psalms to try to determine which ones they might have been singing because they undoubtedly were singing one of the 150 Psalms from the book that David gave us in the middle of the Bible because the Jewish people all knew those and sang them. And it reminded me that we don't always have, like they didn't have words projected onto the walls of that prison. They didn't have hymn books they could open. They had to know these songs by heart. And even this morning when I woke up before I got out of bed, my mind was uh, you know, beginning to wake up. And some of the great hymns came to my mind. Uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. And one that I love, I don't know if you know it, but it says, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. So to me, this is a form of meditation. We meditate on scripture, but we also meditate on the old and new songs. And what frightens me is that we used to have longevity to our music. So when my wife Katrina was nearly dead, I mean, she was passing away, she was almost unconscious, but she began quoting, she's in heaven now, but the last bit of her life, she started quoting hymns. And, uh, and they came to her mind very clearly because she had sung them all of her life. So we need some songs that we sing when we're 10 years old and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. And a lot of today's music is disposable. It comes and goes too fast for us to memorize it. So I really encourage as a spiritual discipline, the singing of some songs over a lifetime and long enough so that they become installed in our minds mm -hmm. because in the middle of the night, we need to be able to have a song to sing. When we're on an airplane and tired and we lean against the side of the plane, we need to have scriptures and hymns that come to our mind mm -hmm. uh, because the, I can't tell you how transformative that has been to me. So based upon Paul's experience in Philippi, I've added that chapter. You know, I love the story in there where you're talking about that, about the elderly man who was uh, far into the dementia and uh, someone started playing hymns and, and he just got up and sang, didn't he sing? And like lead a, a congregation that wasn't there, it was just him and the piano player, but it all came back to him. That's right. That happened at America's Keswick, not too far from where you guys are. Wow. And uh, Bill Welty was the uh, director who sat down at the piano. And the man got out of his wheelchair. He went up actually onto the platform as though he were leading music. He had been a worship leader all of his life. Wow. He led every verse of every song that Bill played. Mm -hmm. And then he sat back down and he never said another word for the rest of his life. But for that half hour... He was lucid because the lifelong images of those hymns were written very deeply in his heart. And we're all going to need those in our latter days, and I need them right now. That's right. Amen to that. I have to ask you about uh, just, uh, you have a, a pretty good illustration, I thought, really uh, timely for someone who is, uh, trying to follow God and they feel like a door is slammed in their face or the, the door is closed. Let's just say the door is closed. You had a good illustration of how, I mean, what do we do? Do we just turn away or do we try to bulldoze our way through the door? But I, could you just share with us your thoughts on that? Yes, so many people struggle with closed doors. They, uh, they fall in love with someone who doesn't reciprocate or they apply for a job and they don't get it or they lose their scholarship in college or whatever it is. I mean, there's a thousand closed doors. Paul and Silas and Timothy went across all of Turkey looking for places to preach. And it was a thousand miles from the east side of Turkey all the way to Troas. And it says the Lord wouldn't allow them to go there. The Spirit of God prevented them. 
They couldn't find a place to preach. They had a thousand miles of open doors until they got to the westernmost coast, the city of Troas. And then God sent a vision that said, come over to Europe and help us. And that was the open door. But the th it really struck me, uh, Tom and Amanda, that they had a thousand miles of closed doors before they had the one open door. And it reminds me that we have many more closed doors than we have open doors in life because for every one thing that the Lord wants us to do, there are many things that he doesn't want us to do. And when I go back and look at my life, there were times when I really wanted something to happen or an opportunity to materialize and it didn't. And I was disappointed, I was crushed at the time, but looking back, I am so thankful because that wasn't what God wanted me to do. He had something better later on. So I've learned not to try to push doors open. I may knock at them, I may nudge a little bit, but if I have to force it open, it probably isn't what God wants me to do. He has something better for me later on. So I learned from that, we shouldn't be discouraged when the door slams in our face because it's God's way of, through circumstances, guiding us to his very best for us. This is just so much wisdom, Robert. We cannot thank you enough. Your book is chocked full of that in just real life situations. And I feel it like this is what my life has looked like. A lot of closed doors and then those few open ones and you're like, okay, God says go, then you go. But something else you bring up is about generous giving and how it's just important to be that generous giver as it is for the one on the receiving end. Yeah, what I didn't fully understand until I studied for this book is that the church in Philippi is the Bible's number one exhibit A when it comes to a generous church that supports missions. And Paul talks about it in the book. In fact, the whole book is a thank you letter to them for their continual support. But in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he devotes two chapters to talking about the generosity of the churches of Macedonia. Well, that was primarily the churches that made up this Philippian congregation. And so, uh, so this is a, a, a church that more than any other, this one church teaches us how to be generous. And of course, it's to this church that Paul gave that wonderful uh, admonition that, that, um, that I refer to later in the book, uh, do not worry about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. Uh, the whole makeup of this book of Philippians is so rich in so many ways uh, that it does tell us that whatever happens, here is a strategy for dealing with difficult times. Robert, let's bring it to where people are at right now. Maybe someone's watching, they've experienced those difficulties, they've experienced uh, struggles. So for those struggling in, 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 with their faith, what would you like them to hear right now? What would you say to them? In fact, sp just speak to them right now, uh, the truths that God has shown you out of the book of Philippians. Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. In Philippians chapter four, Paul wrote, the Lord is near, therefore do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. We need to learn to practice the presence of God. He is with you. If you know him as savior, then he is close to you right now. He's in that very room. He is within you, he is around you, he is surrounding you, and you can lean upon his presence. If you don't know him as savior, then this is the time to make a commitment to him. But the key to the book is in chapter one, verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We don't know what's going to happen from day to day, but whatever happens, we can determine that we're going to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You can do that, and when you do that, that is victory. Robert, thank you so much. And to everyone out there, what are you waiting for? Go get yourself a copy of this book. It will bless you, uh, highly recommended. It is just a a deep dive, uh, but an accessible dive into the book of Philippians. Thank you so much, Robert Morgan, for uh, being with You're us welcome. today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have a scripture. We're going to have some prayer just for you.
Discover what God's Word has to say about healing and deliverance. Best-selling author John Eckhart makes topical Bible study easy with his new book, Scriptures for Faith, Deliverance, and Healing. This handy reference is for those who want to have a greater understanding of healing and deliverance to incorporate God's Word into their prayers. Eckhart also includes targeted commentary to highlight key scriptures and life application. His spirit-filled perspective will enhance your time in God's Word and encourages the spiritual disciplines of memorization and meditation. Request scriptures for faith, deliverance, and healing as our thank you gift when you support Cornerstone Television this month. Request your copy today. If you want to strengthen the ministry of CTVN, share your best gift by visiting us online at ctvn.org slash donate or call us at 888-665-4483. Thank you for your partnership. Hope happens here. Wow, what a powerful interview. You know, just the thought about practicing the presence of God. And that, you know, the encouragement it brought to me, I know it brought to you as well because he was just speaking truth, real life truth and how to navigate using God's word as your guide. And speaking of practicing the presence, let's just reread that scripture that he spoke of at the end, Philippians 1, 27 and 28. It says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. I know, Tom, I have felt that fear, you know, come in like a flood sometimes and you need the word of God. You need those hymns as he spoke about, you know, that just to come yeah. bubbling up out of your spirit to remind you of who he is in that moment. You know, I'm always amazed uh, and uh, probably naively so about opposition, opposition to the gospel, opposition to the things of God. I mean, it's good news, right? Who's going to be opposed to good news? But it's not, it doesn't work that way because this news also calls people and authorities and principalities to account uh, before him. And so when we, uh, we will, we will, all who, all who desire to live righteous in God shall suffer persecution, it says. Sooner or later, persecution is going to come. Now, I'm not talking about when we've done something wrong and we suffer for that. There's a remedy for that as well. It's repentance, it's the blood of Christ applied and forgiveness and all of those things and restitution and restoration, all those things. But I'm talking about now more of just we're, we're just going about doing the things we think we should do and opposition comes or difficulties come or doors are closed in our face. And, and we think, God, what is this? Look, we've got to be able to fight through and stand through those things. Again, I'm not saying fight in the natural. I'm saying fight on your knees in prayer. Fight w with the, the principalities and powers that are coming against you. Or just say, God, is this not? Is this not the door you want me to walk through? Even though it seems so much like it is. I don't know how many times, Amanda, I've heard people of God talk about closed doors and even death of a vision and how they've had to, had to say, God, you called this vision. Why in the world isn't this thing happening? Um, and, but they've laid it down. It's died in their heart. They've said, okay, Lord, I'm not picking that up again. But then God resurrects it at a later time. After, maybe after some work has been done in here, maybe so, some ground has been prepared. God does that. I loved how he said like the book of Philippians and that little bit of history, like how Paul was on his way somewhere and I mean, the catastrophes that were happening, you know, the shipwreck, the viper bite, the reality is we've all had those moments. Maybe you haven't, I don't know. You can call our prayer line. We wanna know what you're doing if you've not. But for most of us, I think we've gone through that where, and you're like, God, what is happening? You thought you were headed in one direction, but I love what he said. It was a furtherance of the gospel. There was something, you know, I think of our own family, like with our own child's waywardness and how the depths that that created in us as parents, like, because we had to dig into the word at a greater way than we ever had before. And now to see it literally did cause the gospel to go farther well, yeah, because your, Andrew your son, is sharing in so many different places now. Yeah, your son, Andrew, I mean, he is mm -hmm. moving forward with the gospel. Yes. I mean, it's, it's so fantastic. I know you and Gary have been through so much, but God is doing something fresh and new coming out the other side. 
And, and that's, that's, I think, what the, the message is here today, is that uh, God has uh, the, the path for you. He has the way for you. Now, what's great about this is it isn't done in a vacuum. It is done with relationship with God, relationship with Jesus, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, getting to know the Father heart of God. All these things are part of this. So we're not just like battling through in some kind of stale situation or some kind of secular earthly situation. No, we have a relationship with God. And I have to tell you, you never learn about someone as much as when you battle with them. And when you're battling uh, alongside Jesus, alongside the Holy Spirit, he begins to pour things into you that are fresh and new and deeper. And you know what? He even gives you a love for the, the, the ones that are fighting you because he loves them too. And he wants to see them come to know him as Lord and Savior. Think of the person who wrote the book we were talking about today, not Robert Morgan, Paul, the book of Philippians. He was an enemy of the, the cross. He was an enemy of those that were preaching the gospel, but God saved him and brought him into a new place. He wants to do that with you. He wants to do that with those that oppose you because God is a miracle working God and he's gonna do that for you today. It is so important. I just encourage you, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I mean, that's literally where it all begins. He is right there. Ask him to come in and fill you. Choose this day who you will serve and may you choose to serve Jesus. What a powerful statement we can make. So what, what does that mean? If you don't know the Lord, again, he has left, he has, he has done so much for you. He's taken the penalty of sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You've sinned, I've sinned, everybody has. We're all in this same boat. We cannot save ourselves. We need God to reach down and save us. And he's doing that right now. He's reaching out to you. So what's your responsibility? It's just to respond to respond and say, God, I open up the, my life to you. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior and I will follow you. He will give you the strength. He will fill you with the Holy Spirit. He will give you a new purpose in life and you will begin to see life the way it was always meant to be seen through the lens of Jesus Christ. Have a great day.